Well, it's safe to say that this video idea got out of hand really fast. Get your snacks ready. The Ben 10 franchise, something so big it's almost hard to fathom. It's gone from looking like this, to this, to this, heck, even this but we'll talk about that one a little bit later. Hitting at just the right time when Cartoon Network was digging their hooks into the action cartoon genre, little did they know that this new and interesting cartoon about a boy who can turn himself into an array of aliens to save the day with his cousin and grandpa would turn into one of the network's biggest and most important intellectual properties. Starting this journey to watch every single Ben 10 series and film didn't seem as terribly daunting as it felt while going through it. From 2005 to now, Ben 10 has spanned five different series of shows containing a total of nearly 400 episodes including specials, a handful of movies, and some shorts. That's a lot more than I expected if I'm being honest, but what made it so much more of a heavy task was the complex interconnected story that runs through the different series creating a narrative that only feels more and more put together like a case board and you're Charlie trying to put it all together the more you watch. You wanna talk about stress? You wanna talk about stress? I mean that in a good way for the most part. Today, I wanted to take a deep dive look into the world of Ben 10 and experience it all in succession versus the way I watched part of it as it came out. Over the course of three videos, we will make our way through all of what Ben 10 has to offer. Today for part one, we're going to take a look at the classic original version of Ben 10 and everything in relation to that era, consisting of the main show, a few movies, and so much more. For me personally, anything beyond the third series, Ultimate Alien, it's all new territory for me. I remember when the fourth series, Omniverse, came out and for some reason I never continued from Ultimate Alien to it, thinking it was just a reboot of the series when it was more of a refresh and still a continuation. As far as the fifth series, which was a reboot, all I know is that it now looks more in line with the middle 2010s Cartoon Network look. Over these few videos, we will cover a lot of ground. While some will be familiar to me, a lot will be new and hopefully exciting. I want to get into the juicy nuances of this show, what makes it tick and the effects it had on its fans, the industry, and beyond. Also, with knowing the popularity of the franchise, it's bound to have some thoroughly mixed opinions, especially from the original versus where we are currently at all this time later. I find myself at this unique position of being a fan of the show early on, but having no preconceived notions about where it went to after that. I just never watched it. So what better excuse now than by making this three-part series? Welcome to Ben 10. I have so been looking forward to this. Now a word from our sponsor. Thanks so much to today's sponsor, Harry's. The razor brand that's reimagining and reinventing the personal care industry. I am pretty picky when it comes to shaving. I need a blade that I can trust and I need to keep more money in my pocket. Relatable to most, I'm sure. Harry's is able to check those two big boxes off. These blades you see here are their sharpest blades ever, giving a nice, clean, and comfortable close shave. Plus the textured grip and weighted core gives you the optimal grip and full control. Oh, and their smooth shave gel helps the razor effortlessly glide over your skin. Also, it's pretty refreshing thanks to its natural ingredients like aloe and cucumber. Harry's motto is fair prices, always making sure that they make quality razors and sell them at said fair prices. Harry's also has a 100% money back guarantee, so if you aren't satisfied, they will refund you fully. So redeem Harry's starter set for only $3. That's a $13 value for only $3 using my link in the description below. Thanks so much again to Harry's for sponsoring today's video. All right! Cartoon Network in the mid-2000s was quickly pivoting a lot of their shows into a more action-packed focus, with the creators behind Ben 10 being the catalyst for a lot of what the action genre would look like for the network. The popularity of this show would spiral out of control to legacy heights that seem unattainable to most cartoons, even nowadays. Other shows like Mega's XLR and even Man of Action's other work for the network get overshadowed and pushed aside because nothing was bringing in the attention. 
attention, and more importantly to them, the money like Ben 10 was. It has a great name, a great premise, and it was marketable. What kid at the time wouldn't want to have the power to turn themselves into a selection of aliens that give you superhero-like power so you can become an interdimensional, intergalactic, interspecies legend? Oh, is that the Omnitrex in the Target Toy Owl for $30 and something I can beg my mom for? If you can't tell, this is where the madness begins. Because something like this can't last forever, right? Something at some point has got to give. But any time the network noticed that happening, it was just time to give everything an update, which resets the marketability. And oh boy, is that the new Omnitrex for $35 in the Target toy aisle? Only a few franchises ever reached this level of notoriety, growth, and longevity. While not as big as something like Pokemon, Minecraft, or in more recent years, Fortnite, there is an easy case to put Ben 10 possibly in the top 10 when you see the bigger picture by the end of this series. The original Ben 10 series, later referred to as Ben 10 Classic, was first shown off in the form of a teaser trailer for Cartoon Network's Cartoon Sneak Peek Week on December 27, 2005. It premiered its first official episode on January 14, 2006, just over three weeks later. Our story starts off with a call to action for our main protagonist, the adorably bratty and arrogant young 10-year-old Ben Tennyson. On the last day of school, his grandfather Max picks him up for their summer RV camping trip, and he he quickly discovers his cousin, Gwen, is joining them. These two are not particularly happy about this fact as they are at constant odds butting heads about everything from larger issues to the smallest of annoyances. Ben here is always more of the agitator for these situations and don't get me wrong, Gwen does jump in to dish it right back but it's usually the attitude served by Ben's 10 year old angst. After a particularly rough first day of summer vacation, Ben decides to go on a walk. During his walk, while he's strolling the woods with his woes, he is kinda attacked by a watch looking device that has fallen from space toward him. The watch attaches itself to his wrist and of course, he's gotta touch all the buttons. Without wasting any time, he transforms himself into a fire being. And you know what? Fire and forests are not the best combination contrary to popular belief. Who would have thought? So yes, he proceeds to start a wildfire that quickly gets out of control. Seeing the flames, Grandpa Max and Gwen proceed to run toward the fire, which is definitely not what you're supposed to do if you ever find yourself in this circumstance. But nevertheless, they were worried about Ben. They discover that Ben is actually the fire being, and after literally fighting fire with fire, they manage to quell the flames. Obviously, this whole situation has kind of shaken up everyone, or so we think. Grandpa Max specifies that Ben hadn't transformed into a monster, but instead an alien species. He's not a monster. He's an alien. And he suspiciously seems to know something about this watch, being appropriately wary of the kind of attention it may draw for them. Now, why would a plumber who plums things know anything about the difference between monsters and aliens? And this weird watch device? Something here isn't adding up, and it's not because I'm bad at math. In the following episodes, we learn a lot about the watch, the Omnimatrix, or also called the Omnitrix. Its unpredictability, its catalog of various alien life forms when it times out, who is actively hunting it down and why Grandpa Max seems to know so much about it. The overall big bad of the show, Vilgax, aka Space Calamari, is after the watch and deploys so many different tactics to try and get it. From going in full force and brutal, to psychologically manipulating, and even sending in some bounty hunters to get the job done. He should have done better on his resume read-throughs before hiring because one of them is a double agent, Tetrex, a Petrosapien, which is the same race as Ben's Diamond Head. This character becomes the base guide to what the Omnitrex is, and will lead to some important stuff in the Secret of the Omnitrex special, but we will get to that later. Why is this watch so important? Why does Vilgax need to get his hands on it? Why does Tetrix know so much about it? So many questions. Oh, you'd like answers? Sure, that makes sense. The Omnitrix itself is at the center of this massive galactic war due to the power it holds. And I'm not just talking about the alien DNA, I mean it's literally a major power source that can literally blow up the universe. But we don't need to worry about that just yet. There's a lot here to this show than just the base concept would have you believe. This all coming from the minds of Man of Action. Be right back.
Man of Action, a company founded by four men, mans, mans of action, men of action. Since their founding, they have created some pretty impressive shows along with some video games and graphic novels like Disney XD's Ultimate Spider-Man, Marvel's Avengers Assemble, Big Hero 6 Comics, and much more. The Creator Studio and Writer Collective was created back in 2000. And with an origin story like theirs, it kind of seems like fate meant for their ideas to come to fruition. Four friends, Joe Casey, Joe Kelly, Duncan Rolu, and Steven T. Siegel. They started to get tired of having to walk the floor of San Diego Comic-Con every year. They decided to invest in booking their own table for the following year's convention, and were placed in a very way-in-the-back location of the convention and called themselves Man of Action. They were approached by a filmmaker who asked for their assistance in writing four short films, which he had recently received funding for. They agreed, and although they are currently unsure of whatever came of those shorts, the projects were enough to get the ball rolling. They were kind of forced into properly establishing their company as an official LLC when a check was made out to just Man of Action, and they realized they wouldn't be able to cash it without making it official, and hence why we have the studio that we know today. As a team of comic lovers and writers, they had all met through prior experience in writing for various graphic novels like X-Men and Superman, which aided in them being enlisted to make X-Men Legends, an Activision video game. This helped them get their start with an interviewer who was familiar with the four of them, Matt Senreich, co-creator of Robot Chicken on Adult Swim. He recommended them to Cartoon Network. Senreich was approached by the network with an idea of making a new action hero TV show, just like the Fantastic Four, but with new heroes and for kids. Through Senreich, Cartoon Network invited the four of them to pitch their ideas for this new superhero kids show. The mans of action were very open about hating the idea of a Fantastic Four type of show for kids, so they came up with 20 very different ideas and pitched them all in 20 minutes. Rapid fire, 60 seconds a pitch. The network landed on lucky number seven, plus one. They, they landed on eight. Every 60 seconds, we're going to pitch you a different show, and then we're just going to move along. You'll know when you hear it. And we did the first one, 60 seconds in, it wasn't even done, rang the bell, moved on to the next one. Eighth thing we did was Ben 10, and Sam was just like, stop, that's it. We'll take it. Which was inspired by the Men of Action's childhood desire to transform into not just one superhero, but ten superheroes. Greedy. And you guessed it, show idea number eight would transform itself into the multi-billion dollar superhero franchise just a few years later, now known as Ben. 10. Well, this was the early idea for Ben 10. The concept is still there, but looking at Stephen E. Gordon's art, we see the superhero aspect of it was very much just humans in special suits and all have some sort of special powers. I mean, look at Ben. Who is he? Later on, the idea would morph more into the alien concept, while still keeping the humanoid body type intact. A solid array of looks here that would essentially be the rough drafts for the final versions we would come to see. Yo, is Grey Matter okay? I think someone should check on Grey Matter. I do like this classic watch look the Omnitrix has. That's the Rolex of Omnitrixes. The Omni Rolex. Sophisticated. We did have these screenshots from the test footage that was previously lost up until 2021, where we have a few seconds of very bad quality footage confirming its existence. But looking just at the pictures, it's a bit uncanny. Ben is just slightly off from his final look and Gwen apparently didn't get a haircut. And shout out to the Ben 10 archive Tumblr for the footage and images. As far as the show goes, Ben himself is an interesting character. I mean, heck, he should be. His name's the title of the show. From the jump, we get to see his interactions with his cousin and grandpa as Ben comes off as the I know better type who hears things in one ear and it's right out the other. He kinda sucks, but in the charming way that Ben is still a kid with this new weight on his shoulders or at wrist of being this protector of the Omnitrix. We see throughout the series him dealing with struggles of having to be the one to carry this burden while at the same time loving the abilities he has from it. In later series we deal with this a little bit more, but we even see moments where there may be a reward or notoriety for the heroism once the public cheers on the works of the aliens that keep saving the day. If there's anything I can do to repay you... Well, now that you mention it... Grandpa! At first, Ben is like, hey, some fame, some thanks for my hard work, and money on top of that, sign me up. Rescued a bunch of people from a burning building or any... Superhero guilt. 
pretty low. But again, he's 10, and so Grandpa is very much his guide into how to go about this in all the right and proper ways. And what do I get? Nothing. Being a hero isn't about others knowing you did something good. It's not fair. Being a hero is its own reward. He's not saving the day for money, he's saving the day because that's the right thing to do. With great power comes great profits in the toy market. Beyond this, Ben often comes off selfish in many situations that result in upsetting Grandpa Max and annoying Gwen. Do you expect me to trust you if you keep misusing the watch? I do like the disconnected family feeling dynamic the show goes for. There are moments where they are all in chaos, tensions are high, and not everyone is in the best mood to be nice. But we get some moments in between where we just get to see them all have some downtime or fun along their cross-country drive. We see the bickering between Ben and Gwen when, but we still get those subtle moments that there is care for one another, even if Ben is still a jerk. As for the rest of the characters in the original series, Grandpa Max is the peacekeeper that really just tries his best to make sure Gwen and Ben don't rip each other's heads off. He is a kind, older gentleman who proves to be extremely limber and essential in a fight despite being a grandpa. His main personality attributes are incorporating strange bugs and sea creatures into his culinary ventures, and being the coolest person ever. He trained to be an astronaut and has actually been in space. He always references his plumber days, but as we watch the series, it's quickly revealed that the Plumbers are a secret society that serve as an intergalactic peacekeeper and overall protectors of Earth. His honest but really interesting slightly secretive personality leaves a lot to be discovered and you can't help being naturally drawn to him as a character. This whole plumber business becomes quite the major character identity and plot point as we move on to the other series of Ben 10. Even when it comes to the overall villain, he personally already dealt with him and won. Grandpa Max is the original, original Ben 10, but instead of turning Turning into several aliens to defend the universe, he gets with aliens. No, really, the Roswell alien was actually this alien here, Xylene, and they have quite the history together. Thanks for your brave ventures, Space Cadet. Great, now I just want to play Mass Effect again. We still get our fair share of excitement around here. Ben's cousin Gwen Tennyson can be just as childish as Ben, but also just as mature as Grandpa Max. She serves as a more mature voice of reason and intelligence in comparison, and that is something that doesn't change over all of the series, even when her limits are tested by Ben severely. She's technologically savvy and is also very familiar with martial arts and gymnastics. What can't she do? Her quick thinking and adaptation allows her to fight really well, but the original series seems to struggle with finding Gwen's place in the fights they run into at least at first. Despite her small stature and young age, she manages to get involved with fights just as much as her large grandpa and superpowered cousin. But as the battles become more and more intense, it's clear that she needs a bit more to work with. Like magic. No, for real. The first two seasons, she goes back and forth between superpowered and not, with both the Lucky Girl arc, where she acquires a lucky charm and uses it to fight crime, and also with her being able to wear the Omnitrix to fight Vilgax. Only on one occasion, though. In the third season, she and the Witch Charmcaster, apprentice to the Master Magician Hex, have a Freaky Friday moment where they switch bodies, unlocking the magical abilities in Gwen's body since she is already predisposed to it because of her already existing magical aura. Why? Because why not, I guess. These characters serve more as direct villains for Gwen to deal with, giving Ben a slight break from the direct conflict. I think overall giving Gwen some more importance in the story and fighting scenarios was something that needed to be done. The show didn't want to leave this third member of the team without something to do in moments that would have her literally doing nothing. I think that more magical powers in contrast to the alien abilities or the more strength and gadget based stuff is a smart choice mixed with her smarts. It's a winning combination and I like that Gwen gets to feel more helpful and less like a tag along. Other reoccurring villains include a young boy named Kevin E. 11. Yeah, Kevin 11. Y you see what they did there? But you know what's an even funnier Easter egg about Kevin 11 here? Well, the episode that he debuts in happens to be the seventh episode. 7 11. He is introduced as a young delinquent living a life of crime on the streets. Due to his supernatural abilities to absorb energy and power, he gets to explore the variety of his abilities when he meets young Ben, and he absorbs a lot of information from the watch, turning him into something that isn't quite human anymore, fueling his hatred towards Ben for, in a way, 
cursing him. In the classic series, he serves as the main reoccurring villain and plays a role as representation of what Ben could be if he chooses to be selfish with his powers. But despite this, Kevin is always extended an open hand by the Tennyson family in hopes that he will make a recovery and choose to stop using his powers for selfish, violent gain. Going on to have very intriguing, thought-provoking, and well-written storylines thanks to him being a staple character in the sequel series. And I really like the initial time he is introduced, specifically when Ben, dealing with himself and his internal struggles of who he is, what he can do and can't do with his own powers, all while Kevin is being this guide to destruction, nearly wanting to kill a bunch of train passengers. But of course, Ben snaps back to reality and the gravity of the situation hits him. While he does what's right, he has still disappointed Grandpa Max and breaks the trust in him. It's a good lesson, one that kind of just fades away rather than dealing with these consequences of his actions, but a good showcase of what doing wrong can bring upon oneself and those around you. So like, the main thing about this show is that Ben can use his watch to turn into a bunch of different aliens. And fun fact, one of the contenders for the Omnitrix's name in the series pre-production was the Mega Deoxyribonucleic Transdimensional Transforminal Numerator. Now, that's a name. But let's name and take a look at all the different aliens Ben can become. The 10 aliens that Ben is originally able to transform into are Heat Blast, the first alien we meet that has the fire powers. Wild Mutt, basically a giant furry dog mouth with legs, and although he has no nose, sure has a great sense of smell. Diamond Head, a very large crystalline alien that can grow and regenerate extremely durable green crystals. XLR8, like Accelerate, is a super speedy aerodynamic alien with wheels for feet. Gray Matter, the smallest of them all physically, but the one with the biggest brain, and we find out why later. Forearms, which seems to be Ben's go-to as one of the largest and strongest aliens who is super strong. He has four arms. What are you, a red machamp? What's the deal with Ben? Stink Fly is a stinky fly that has the main power of flight, great range of vision, and the power of spitting goo. Rip Jaws is another really strong one, but he's really strong in the water, so he can breathe in water and swim really fast. Upgrade is made of nanites that can change their size, altering his body shape and type, and also has these tech powers which allow him to merge or possess any alien tech, which is a niche power, but it comes in handy more than you'd think. Lastly, the Ghost Freak is this ghost ghost-like creature that has a lot of traditional ghost-like abilities, such as phasing through solid objects, invisibility, and possession, just to name a few. And ugh, I'm still upset about the Bancraft Academy breakup. Team Ben all the way. Ghost Freak's alien race of DNA can contain a full life with just a few particles. Ghost Freak was different from all the other aliens in the watch. He was a full-on alien and there was always this weird aura around Ghost Freak that unsettled Ben before we get to this reveal. The Omnitrix is full of alien DNA that Ben can turn into, but it's not the aliens themselves. It's still Ben, but his molecules get all rearranged to become the different alien races for a limited time. So the reveal with Ghost Freak was a really cool way to explore some lore about another alien race. These aliens had quickly become the most memorable and nostalgia-driven characters, even warranting guest appearances, full-on mainstays and references in various other continuations of the series. Although the watch can only have 10 species accessible at a time, at least it's supposed to, when the need arises for the watch to be reset, the watch swaps out the 10 for a new 10 species, sometimes repeating and sometimes introducing completely new ones. In the original series, we even see that the watch gets a taste of alien DNA while coming into contact with attackers of different species, and learn from the DNA how to transform its wear genetically into a specific species. Wow, I guess Ben does have Kevin Eleven's powers in a way. And while I appreciate an entire universe of unique and fresh alien species that we are allowed to explore, there could be a hundred more. Part of me craves the consistency of having just the original 10. And yes, my therapist did say I'm afraid of change, but that has nothing to do with this and I have a perfectly normal relationship with change. On one hand, when we get new aliens, we run the risk of getting another blocks equivalent. But on the other hand, we can sell more toys. Yeah, the Lego market is in shambles. You know, I don't even hate blocks. He reminds me of this one Blockman Yu-Gi-Oh card, or even like Toy Agumon from Dingy. <laughs> For real though, it actually is fun to explore just a small fraction of the hundreds of thousands of alien species in both our galaxy and even our neighboring one that the Omnitrix is able to study and log. It also leaves so much room to explore in 
the future. In the rest of the original series, we are introduced to Cannonbolt, a big boy with a broad, armor-plated body. He has speed strength that can transform into a sphere, like a roly-poly. Wildvine, who can control plans, has explosive fruit, and can regenerate like you've never seen. Spitter, who spits a lot and can inflate like a pufferfish. Buzzshock, who can control electricity and technology as well as absorb and redirect it. Arctiguana is like an iguana, but instead of being hot in hot places, he's cold in cold places. He can fight with ice rays and he can't freeze himself. That's helpful. Blitzwolfer, which is more like a werewolf with enhanced agility, strength, howling, and speed, among many other abilities. Snarrow is a mummy-like elastic alien that can shapeshift, regenerate, and fight with his wrappings. Frankenstrike is an alien based off Frankenstein's monster. Along with being super strong, he can also utilize electro and technokinesis. Upchuck is the CEO of Mom, I threw up. Ditto, not the Pokemon, can duplicate himself. Eye Guy is a bat thing with eyes on his body. It scares me, but I'm cool with it. Lastly, there's Way Big, who is way big, but we will talk about him soon. And then if we really want to be detailed, there's three other, or I guess six other aliens we can talk about here for Ben. In the episode, Dr. Animo and the Mutant Ray, the Omnitrix is having issues like it always does, and Ben's definitely not helping the situation here. But throughout this episode, we get to see some uh, mistake DNA mixing together, like this. This is Stink Arms, which is Forearms and Stink Fly. Ooh, but don't forget about Diamond Matter, which is Diamond Head and gray matter, I think that's self-explanatory, and heat jaws. I'll give you five seconds to just take a guess at which two are put together. I think this is a cool concept that they could have explored definitely a little bit further on, if not just for like more fun gags, but there's just something about stink arms. I just, I can't look at them. I think I'm just more offended at the name though. Diamond Matter, however, that's one cool dude. The Omnimatrix is really its own character throughout the show, based on it rarely doing what Ben wants it to do. It will constantly shoot out the wrong alien Ben was expecting, making the situations being solved a tougher feat for Ben. On top of this, why not make it more hard with its parental controls? Every time he uses the watch, he has a 10 minute time limit to be any of the aliens before it shuts off, and then it starts a 10 minute cooldown time where he's all on his own as just a 10 year old kid. But it does make these moments moments a lot more tense and exciting to see how Ben and company get out of these problems when he can't turn into a, a diamond. Man, that's rough. He does accidentally unlock the master controls to the Omnitrex in the finale of the second season, allowing him to fully transform and control the alien forms by just thinking it, but it gets undone when he sacrifices it to Vilgax and Kevin in an effort to save Gwen from their clutches. Ouch. As far as the way the aliens look, heck, in general, all of the alien characters outside of Ben's lot of them are all really cool looking. Knowing where the concept art was at to where the final designs got to, it's really nice to see the evolution and fleshing out of these characters. Rather than keeping them humanoid, they feel more otherworldly and unique with their designs, making sense for the things that they can do. Vilgax looks awesome and only continues to look awesome as the other series come out, so it always feels like his character is evolving or changing based on each interaction he has with Ben. There's so much personality and flair to every little bit of the characters and the world of Ben 10 feels like it grows with it, lore-wise. The whole plumber secret organization for Grandpa Max opens the world of Ben 10 into a whole other level of sci-fi layered goodness. This whole intergalactic alien battling business didn't start with Ben. He's just our vessel into this bigger picture. The Plumbers are an intergalactic police force that deal in space justice. I love saying space justice. This space justice is carried out with wickedly neat design gadgets that are ready to take on anything threatening the universe. This bit of lore is a huge part of what makes the future set of series so much more interesting than just the surface level alien fighting action. The early bit of the show, mainly season one and some of season two, really are just establishing what in the Omnitrix is happening here, but for the remainder of the seasons, we spend time opening up what was previously established. It does feel like quite a bit at a certain point. I have to pull out the whiteboard to keep up with the narrative once we start getting into some of the more in-depth sci-fi elements, especially when they create a timeline that feels necessary yet unimportant at parts. Let's look at the Ben 10,000 episode, where a future version of Gwen comes back to the past to get her and Ben to aid the dubbed hero of heroes, Ben 10,000. A future version of Ben that one, has more abilities, and two, has let the ego we've seen the young Ben have get to his head. From the way he still treats people 
people in his life to, um, I don't know, the giant statue proclaiming that he's this larger than life hero. Through this future narrative though, we get to a point where future Ben comes around to being a better person to the people in his life, just like that, which in turn aids Ben in realizing that he can be a jerk to others as well. I mean, he found his own self 20 years in the future to be a jerk. That's gotta mean something to you. When Ben is back in the past, we see how he starts to understand and care for others, but the problem with this show is that the lessons being taught, which are pretty blatant at the start of every episode, as to which lesson Ben is going to learn, is that he rarely, if never, grows from them. Oh, what makes all of this more complicated for the Ben 10 timeline, like I alluded to earlier, is that this and another episode, Ken 10, are both an alternate future. There is a Ben all grown up in the future, but these two episodes are not the same future as that future, if that makes sense. It's like a multiverse. And that is totally the first time you've heard the word multiverse, right? This Ben 10,000 universe is dubbed the original timeline, where Ben is a superhero which branched away from the main or prime timeline to become its own little possibility of what could have been. The main timeline is where the true canon lies, containing the full events of Ben 10, Alien Force, Ultimate Alien, and Omniverse. So that's fun. But that Ken 10 episode is really cool though, and I don't want to just dismiss it because it's technically not canon. In it, we focus on Ben 10,000's son, Ken 10, who is gifted the starter Omnitrex with the whole limiter thing once again with 10 aliens on it for his 10th birthday. But Ken feels ready for more and wants to be in on the action to help save the day, like Ben did when he was his age. We also get to meet Devlin, who turns out to be Kevin 11's son, and through some devious trickery, he gets Ken to release his father from the void, and also he can look just like the mutated version of Kevin 11. Yep, that's Devlin 11. That is Kevin 11. Are you keeping up? Doesn't matter. This episode doesn't technically matter. But what makes this episode so strong is seeing how far off the deep end Kevin 11 has gone, and how he treats his own son as nothing more than a useless pawn. Leading Devlin to realize the monster his father has become, and now having no family because of it. But Ben 10,000 ends up offering to take him in as part of the family, making sure that he has people around him that care about him, and are helping to make sure that he doesn't become like his father. What a beautiful episode. That doesn't matter to the story of Ben 10 whatsoever, but hey, it's still good TV. But the whole show was good TV. Ben 10 has been nominated and has won a multitude of awards, including Emmys, Annies, voice acting, sound editing, and writing awards. Its accolades could literally fill three pages of research. And I know, I filled three pages of research with it. Mainly, the voice actors are highly awarded and I totally see why, because the voice acting is really good for the majority of the franchise. Of course, we have Tara Strong voicing young Ben Tennyson in the original series, as well as whenever the younger version of Ben shows up in future media which happens a lot. Gwen's voice is provided by Megan Smith, and Grandpa Max is voiced by Paul Eating. Now, for the end of the original Ben 10, we were given a movie, and for me personally, I consider it more of a special since it is also split up into a few episodes, so it's debatable if you consider it a movie or if I consider it a special. There are some many split multi-story episodes, and I think it just fits in with how the series went. Oh, but Jordan, the cover says movie! Eh, semantics. But Ben 10: Secret of the Omnitrix would wrap everything up so far and open up the future of where Ben 10 is heading. It's weird because this movie, or special, or whatever, premiered during Ben 10 week before the remaining eight episodes of the fourth season. But it is the official ending to the series, taking place after the episode that would premiere seven months after the series finale came out, because why not make everything else more confusing? Oh, sorry about that, sport. You got ten minutes, Gramps. My turn! In August of 2007, the TV movie Ben 10 Secret of the Omnitrix was aired on Cartoon Network. In this movie, we learn a lot about the device that the original show didn't deeply dive into. After the Omnitrix has an issue, shocker, Tetrix returns to Ben to investigate the watch as he has received a signal that the watch started its SDM function. Oh yeah, that stands for self-destruct mode. And this urgency is amplified when it has the power to destroy the universe. Okay, the stakes have risen, that's great. Well, not for the universe, but for my entertainment, that's great. From there, we go on an adventure to meet the maker of the Omnitrix, 
Azmuth, a member of the Galvin race, the same race as Grey Matter. The watch serves as a genetic library with records of different species from all around the galaxy. One of the main arguments of Azmuth is that it was created as a way of understanding different species by walking a mile in their shoes. His original intention was not to introduce an all-powerful weapon, but to create something that would instigate peace, understanding, and empathy to the world that is riddled with misunderstanding and judgment. This is actually a really interesting concept that isn't fully explored. We can tell that Azmuth is some kind of super mega genius, so much so that he is able to create a powerful, sleek, and genetically modifying device, and rarely have his technology recreated by others, so it must have been extremely important for him to want to dedicate his life to creating the Omnitrix. But in all this, you just can't help but wonder, if you had the brains and the technology to make something as powerful as the Omnitrix, I think there's a problem with a big overlooked factor of this being turned out and used as a weapon. Because whether you're fighting for good or bad, it's clear that a big aspect of this watch has an ability where it can be weaponized. A 10 year old kid can wield it and use its abilities instantly. Imagine if it were someone more dastardly it got into the hands of. So again, you'd think some super genius inventor would have been able to predict that or even speculate its practical use. I'm not trying to be judgy or whatever, but you'd also think that any good inventor would at least think about the consequences of these things they're inventing. My man discovered a way to genetically change people on a cellular level and didn't expect a more grim outcome? Ridiculous. Nah, for real, I like this fella. Another reason for creating the Omnitrix, which personally is the most compelling reason, is so that they could store the library of DNA and repopulate should any of the species go extinct. A sci-fi concept explored many times before in other media that would make sense. On the topic of weaponizing things, we land on our main inter-series antagonist and Ben's archenemy, the tentacly terrifying Vilgax. Who saw that coming? Vilgax, as we know, was very early on established to be the most terrifying and fearsome of villains that Ben will have to face again and again. But throughout the franchise, we get to see Ben get stronger, defeat Vilgax in many various powerful forms, he is acknowledged as a well-known intergalactic warlord conqueror, who is actually the reason that Ben found the watch in the first place. An old love, I mean partner of Max's, Xylene, was transporting the watch when Vilgax attacked her, and she was forced to send the Omnitrix off of her ship and target it towards Earth for safety. Initially intending to send it straight to Max Tennyson's coordinates, she is slightly off and it lands nearby in the forest where Ben finds it. She explains that his DNA was close enough to Max's that the watch attached itself to him and all the rest is history. Which is such a big reveal that ties in so much back to the start of the show, finally getting some of those answers to fill in the gaps. Ben was never supposed to be a part of this at all. He just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, or the right place at the right time, depending on how you want to look at it. As an end to the cartoon side of things for the series, this was genuinely exciting, action-packed, and hit heavy with lore giving you enough to feel satisfied, and so much to patiently wait for what the future holds for Ben 10. It has some good emotional beats and maybe, just maybe, the lessons he learns he can actually retain. Sometimes you have to see the good in people, and not just be a selfish jerk. But I doubt that. We did get to meet a new alien, this giant race known as the Tokastar, or as we already know him as, Way Big. I'm not just big, I'm way big! How perceptive. But in the same year Secret of the Omnitrix was released, just a few months later, another Ben 10 movie was released, this time taking a step out of the comfort zone of animation and into the live action storytelling format. Race Against Time was the first of the two live-action iterations for the franchise. It was released on November 21st, 2007, and picks up where the original series left off with Ben having to transition from his life in the summer, that revolved around, you know, saving the world, to his boring and socially delicate life at school. His frustration mainly stems from being the center of the focus in the galaxy to being a wedgy receiver and overall weird invisible kid, and we kind of feel for him. He's still a jerk, but like, one you feel sorry for sometimes, you know? But this does mean we get a peek at his life with a secondary identity, which was a trope that I loved as a kid. He's like the Hannah Montana of alien crime fighting, but not a superstar. His parents also aren't much help in his life socially, and if anything, add more social pressure to him. After his first day back at school, he gets in trouble when he attempts to throw a piece of gum-covered paper at his bullies, and instead, hits the principal. And because of this, his parents try to have a talk with him over dinner about, I don't know, being normal? And it morphs into suggesting he makes some more friends his age. Like, geez, 
Sandra and Carl. You sat down to talk to your son about his behavioral problems stemming from being bullied by everyone his age and you transitioned the conversation into making more friends his age? A plus parenting right there. It's evident right off the bat how alienated Ben feels in his own home. He even lies to them about being in the school talent show with Gwen to quell their suspicions about his recent world saving antics. With their non-traditional parenting styles and tofu filled dinners, Ben finds that he doesn't belong at home or at school, but instead the rust bucket, which is later brutally blown up. Honestly, with the screen time they gave this explosion, and with a smaller budget of five million, I just know they blew so much of their budget on it. We also get to see an official plumber facility underneath Bellwood and meet some of the few aging plumbers that are left. It seems that every person in their 60s and 70s in Bellwood is a plumber, like Ben's principal, the fire chief, even the waitress at the cafe that Ben frequents and completely trashes to punish his bullies. That's just disrespectful. Portrayed by Graham Phillips, Ben is actually very much in character compared to his cartoon self. It could be just thanks to good casting and or good writing, but most of the cast is really loyal to their characters. Maybe Grandpa Max is a bit different in tonal delivery and attitude just a bit, but it still translates fairly well. Although the acting may not be winning any Oscars anytime soon, the feeling of Ben 10 was captured well. Throwing in a very cheesy feel with a mixed quality of special effects, it translated to a fun venture. And because of that, I'll basically let it get away with anything. Well, Almost anything. Explain yourself for this! Played by Haley Ram, Gwen is Ben's only friend at school. They still poke fun at each other like they do in the cartoons, but this movie was really important in establishing the strength of their bond as family. But they always find a way to go right back to their old antics. Grandpa Max is played by Lee Majors, the six million dollar man. He's actually really funny and very quickly becomes one of the most likable characters in this movie. I think most of this specifically comes from where Lee and the writers took the character, giving Lee more freedom to add a little pizzazz. The evil villain in this story is Eon, played by Christine Anholt. He's an older alternate timeline version of Ben himself and also a member of an alien time traveling race that wants to take over young Ben's Omnitrix so that he could become a younger, more powerful form of himself in order to bring his race to take over Earth in an alien invasion. Did you get all that? because it sure took me a hot minute to wrap my head around. Look at this whiteboard. While Eon doesn't go into any specifics, he does say that his race were all powerful and learned to control time itself. And that's why he can do this at the start of the movie. He's dead. Ben just murdered someone. His whole plan requires using the hands of Armageddon, a device that would open a gateway to his home so his race can come through. Through this, we meet Constantine Jacobs, or what's left of him, as he exposition dumps a bunch of information for the audience to know, more so than the characters. It's really just to tell us what's happening, because I don't know what's happening. Look at the whiteboard. Luckily, it's delivered well and adds to the cheesier tone. <sighs> And he's dead now. Alive any longer and he would have started remembering when they first Sweet invented chocolate. chocolate. We get to see the time warping abilities in action from Eon and we also finally get to see this happen. <laughs> Nice. Eon does the big reveal of who he is as this older evil version of Ben from a different universe. He gets his DNA into Ben's Omnitrex and leaves knowing his mission is done. So Ben now turns into Eon and is evil and British. Sorry to disappoint you. Gwen ends up using her leveled up speech ability to find the old Ben inside of Eon and it ends up working, stopping the plan Eon set up, which means he needs to come back. There needs to be a fight. And don't worry, there is. Anyway, in the end, Eon fails. Big surprise, he gets blown up again. <laughs> nice. And they're all able to make it out alive, except for Constantine. <laughs> They even still make it in time for their act at the talent show. You can't miss that. Where Ben uses his transformation from Wild Mutt back to himself as the magic act. We get the satisfaction of the bullies acknowledging that Ben is friends with Wild Mutt. And I guess who wouldn't want to be friends with a giant eyeless big mouth dog alien thing? Me. I, I would not want I would not want that. The movie was directed by Alex Winter, or Bill from Bill and Ted, who actually makes an appearance in the film as the dying time-ridden corpse, aka the one and only Constantine Jacobs. Heck yeah. Anyway, Winter is really open about his young son being a fan of the cartoon and having some sort of involvement with the production. He even says that he would help him and correct him on some occasions as to what he should or shouldn't do in certain circumstances. And I think that is pretty cool coming from the kid's perspective. This movie, while not being the most aesthetically pleasing, high production value, has a great charm to it. It doesn't feel far removed from the series, which could have potentially been thanks to Winter being so open to his son and his son's friend's criticisms. But it just has a great tone to it in 
general. While cartoons can get away with lightening its heavier themes due to it being a cartoon, this is something that a lot of live action versions of cartoons can't quite nail. But this live action movie doesn't allow the transition to feel too jarring because it doesn't try too hard. It didn't need to be more than it was. This movie feels more akin to a Shark Boy and Lava Girl or the Spy Kids franchise. I actually loved watching this movie and appreciated it for the blurry shots, sometimes off-putting CGI, and the obviously poorly disguised Baron Warner Bros. set lots. And not to mention its blatant disregard for property damage. And do you know what all this movie means? It means that the last premiered episode of Ben 10 that came out in April of 2008, after both Secret of the Omnitrex and Race Against Time, Goodbye and Good Riddance is another episode that is non-canon. While this time it's less of another timeline and more of a Marvel-style what-if that focuses on Ben going back to school and dealing with not showing off to his classmates who bully him, that he could become a cool, strong alien, just like the live-action movie, which was the direct sequel to The Secret of the Omnitrix. Huh, <sighs> are you confused yet? No? Yes? Whatever you answered, it's one giant web of so much to follow. There was also the Gwen 10 episode that fits the what if side of things, but I promise Ben 10 is comprehensible. More so nowadays rather than back when it was premiering, but at least we can look back properly now. Ben 10 as a whole loves to retcon, going back and confirming or denying things that are and aren't canon. Oh yeah, by the way, Race Against Time is no longer canon. So this story about his return to school and the other story about his return to school are both not canon. None of that mattered. But we're not out of the woods yet with Ben 10. Despite the series going on from this point to age Ben 10 up, which we will cover in the next part of our Ben 10 series retrospective, there was another ride we would have to take in the RV, this time in another new style, 3D animation. This is all a computer simulation. Destroy All Aliens is the next big entry for the younger Ben 10 saga. Even though it would come out all the way in 2012, which is an odd place to see as we were already deep into the older Ben storyline, the original storyline apparently just wasn't over. Because the real ending to Ben before he grows up shows him one year later as now he's 11. It shows us right off the bat how this post road trip trio dynamic still finds the time to fight back against the evil doers, spending their nights out on the streets doing so. The story starts off with Gwen, Ben, and Matt Max fighting against a giant robotic tank. How did she survive that? And how did they survive that? During a dispute between the two cousins, Gwen uses her magic to dismantle the tank while Ben is currently encasing it with upgrade. This results in the Omnitrix malfunctioning, which seems to just be the overall theme of Ben 10. I swear, this happens more often than my upload frequency. Ben has this whole nightmare sequence where he is being attacked by the aliens he can turn into, and for some reason is missing the Omnitrix on his arm in a few shots. Huh. Weird. Anyways, Tetrax is back to see Ben and needed him so that he and Ben can meet up with Azimuth. But Ben's impatient, chucks up the deuces and crashes into a truck that contained the blue version of Waybig. Uh, but this one's... That truck he hit was important, but we'll find out why later. Ben absorbs the blue giant and the day is saved, I guess? Gwen and Grandpa Max are trying to locate where Ben went and this breaks canon as well. Gwen doesn't use this locating power for the first time until Alien Force, but this is Ben 10 and it's okay to be confused, I think. Let's check in on that whiteboard one more time. Okay, we're making progress. Ben falls from the sky after Tetrix's ship gets a hole blown in it, making him land at Stonehenge. Then this galvanic mechamorph shows up, but here's the fun part of this battle. Battle, we start going from Stonehenge to Rio de Janeiro and to Egypt to a city. Okay, yeah, so that truck from earlier, well, that was Azmuth, and this bad guy is just Azmuth's dad who thought his son was killed, and there's this giant evil way big, so then he needed to go and locate him or fight anything in his way. But the evil way big was just Azmuth the whole time. Spoiler alert, I'm sorry. The Omnitrix ends up swallowing them all inside of it during this confrontation that leads to all of them working together to fight the evil way big, but this battle breaks free of the Omnitrix, and while the evil Way big or Toka Star, sorry, I'm just used to calling him Way Big, continues on a rampage through the city. The Omnitrex somehow turns his own parents into some of his aliens. The group here finally puts two and two together and discovers that the giant blue evil Way Big is Azimuth. Now we get this awesome kaiju battle between two Way Bigs here, which just look like Ultraman and a variant color option from Super Smash Bros. They are able to convince Azimuth's father after a while not to attack his own disguised son here because he's still 100% convinced that this thing killed his son. 
Gwen's magic, however, is able to get through to Asmus' mind enough for him to fix the Omnitrix, with everyone all transforming back to their original selves. Oh, and his parents all get turned back eventually, but it would be an interesting family dinner if they didn't. Asmuth tells Ben that he could pick up the readings from the overload of mana inside the watch from all the way across the galaxy, and he needed to come fix the watch. The majority of the same voice cast as the original series returned for this TV movie, which was a really great thing to see. The 3D animation was pretty good. There was a lot of textures and models that translated really well into 3D, especially Ben and Gwen themselves with how animated their facial expressions were. Although it is annoying that the name of the movie is Destroy All Aliens when it's said once in a violent rage when his father tries to attack all of them. I will destroy all aliens! Other than that, it doesn't seem to be a really well-connected theme. Also, while the animation is great, they do constantly fight in an urban city setting which seems to be abandoned because there is literally no people or cars around, aside from that opening scene. But I'm glad there weren't, because if there were, they would all die because of the falling buildings. A classic Ben 10 move, destroying people's livelihoods and homes. No, seriously, this was my biggest problem with the movie. It just felt way too destructive and way too empty. But other than those two things, the movie is a nice little re-exploration and nod to the original series and its canon, while also alluding to a few things that are revealed in Alien Force like the concept of mana and more, despite a few things continuity-wise not adding up. Oh boy, would you look at the RV right there? I mean, it's just completely... <laughs> Even one of the Ben 10 shorts that came out was in direct relation to this film and came out years after the original show to release the same year as the movie. To say Ben 10 didn't have a major impact is just being a liar, and I don't like liars. The success of Ben 10 is not to be understated, because all we've done is talk about the cartoon. What about the merchandise? Good question! but also a stupid one. You know good and well there's merch. A lot of merch. Originally handled by Bandai and later Playmats Toys for the reboot series, the toys were the massive money maker. Action figures either make you or break you, and Ben 10 was made with them. The fact you could just buy this was enough to make every viewer of the show lose their collective minds. Legos, sure, definitely got them. McDonald's tie-in toys, of course. Comic books, clothes, trading cards, video games, and so much more all add up for the franchise being worth around eight billion dollars. That's billions with a B. The B stands for Ben. Ben 10. As far as the video games by themselves, there were quite a bit, but let's mention the ones that correspond with the other Ben 10 series when we get to them. For now, that leaves us with the first game titled Ben 10 on the Hyperscan. Okay, while that is true, this obscure Mattel-made video game console was real and had the first Ben 10 game, it was a platformer and the whole gimmick of the console, not just the game in general, was similar to the e-reader for the Game Boy Advance, where you would buy booster packs of cards to scan or swipe into your game. So the small library that short-lived console had all had card packs related to the games. $20 for the game, $10 for the packs. While the concept for this physical to digital transfer has happened over and over again in different ways throughout gaming, from Amiibos to the e-reader cards and oh boy how about them Skylanders? It was still pretty cool albeit clearly a major cash grab. But the console flopped and it was discontinued very quickly. The other Ben 10 game was on more accessible consoles like the PS2, PSP, the Wii, and the DS. Ben 10 Protector of Earth, developed by High Voltage Software, the creators of too many sports games. In the game, you play as Ben, who can use his Omnitrex abilities to become his classic group of aliens to solve puzzles, navigate the different regions, and take down bad guys in combat. Early in the game, you are limited to some aliens, but gradually unlock the rest of them and even get the master controls unlocked to no longer have cooldown times for the aliens. Your main goal is to blow up and act like you don't know no but. Your main goal is to go and recover Omnitrex DNA samples that Vilgax has stolen before he destroys the world. The game wasn't too hard but offered fans of the show their first chance at controlling these aliens for themselves. Overall it received middling to slightly positive reviews so not too bad for this big jump to the video game world. By the way, I have a new channel I'm starting up soon called Fringe Gaming. If you like the content on this channel and you like to see that in the video game world, check out that channel as I plan on releasing content there very soon. Oh, uh, by the way, did you know that Ben 10 had a game show? Yeah, Ben 10 was so big that Cartoon Network created a competitive game show all around Ben 10. Where's the Pokemon game show? 
I don't see one, but I do see one for Ben 10, so that's saying something. Here's the part where someone in the comments hits me with the, well, there was a Pokemon competitive game. Eh, I don't want to hear it. And you know what? As much of a Pokemon fan as I am, today we are here for Ben 10, and by golly, Ben 10 is what you're gonna get. Starting in the United Kingdom in October of 2011, Ben 10 Ultimate Challenge, produced by 2020, a British production company, would premiere. A total of 12 episodes lasting the average runtime of 22 minutes were ordered from Cartoon Network, where in which it consisted of 36 contestants faced against 13 mind-bending challenges to test their hero skills and knowledge, just to see who was the top Ben 10 fan. It was even called the toughest game show on earth. The toughest game show on earth. See, he also said it, so I, I'm not making that up. I personally would have gone with the toughest game show in the universe, but hey, that's just me. Their forward thinking, however, on this idea led to mass syndication ASAP to 12 other regions outside of the UK, showcasing every region in various languages, getting in on the challenge. Salut et bienvenue dans Ben 10 Ultimate Challenge. I understood none of that. But hey, they even had an app full of extra online activities and ways to be involved with the challenge itself, for all the highlights and much more. You could win anything from an Xbox to an iPod Touch to a TV, but the coolest, like, like no joke here, coolest prize was exclusive animation cells from Ben 10 Ultimate Alien, which is pretty freaking cool. I don't know if a kid would appreciate that, but I think that's cool. And then one day, this show ended. It seemed like a decent sized budget for the sets as well as accounting for each of the regions set up for the show. So the only logical thing for them left to do was just to move on from this, right? Well, yeah, they did. But out of nowhere, in 2017, not super long into the new reboot of the Ben 10 series, a new version of the show would premiere titled Ben 10 Challenge. I guess Ultimate was too much for the players. Here, a kid would be asked trivia-related questions regarding Ben 10, as another kid was digitally collecting aliens in a timed manner, in order to get more questions for their team. Three, two, one, collect those aliens. All while their parent or guardian were hoisted up on some sort of bungee contraption, with the risk of being lifted up in the air. So for wrong answers, you just get to see the torture your adult teammate would face. But that was just the first one I watched, the first game I was introduced to. There's multiple different games that they play, multiple different rounds. But half the time, I didn't know what was happening in this version. But there is a reason for that. This version of the game show was so fast-paced, just like the reboot of Ben 10, the host here would give no breaks in between each of the actions happening. Collect those aliens! It felt bite-sized, and it worked well to keep your attention, however. And of course, there had to be some sort of prize here too. Even second place would get some extra prizes as well. But the winning prizes would be the new Ben 10 video game and some brand new Ben 10 toys. Sorry, Timmy, you ain't getting 10 grand on this show. You're getting this figure of Omni Not Armor Heat Blast. Now scram. And like I said, they played other games that always seemed to put the adult in peril. And just look at this mom's face. I can just tell she's a big fan of Ben 10 and is so happy to be here for her little champions. I have no sympathy. Oh, all right. Well, I, I wish her the best. Hey, you know, keep staying dry. Because I don't think you have anything to worry about. These kids can't hit for... Okay, well, remind me to never have children. For real though, I like Nigel here. He's an energetic host with good charisma with a nice smile to boot. Just don't forget, collect, collect those aliens. aliens. Lasting a total of five episodes as well as being in different regions, it was a fun little game show with some softball-esque questions, all in good fun for the kids to have the time of their lives at that moment. I can easily see a show like this being possible again during whatever the next iteration of Ben 10 is following the end of the reboot series back in 2021. Collect those Aliens. The biggest win Ben 10 gets from all of this, aside from all this money it's made the network, is that the show went on from the original series to become so much more. But there was a big decision to make when continuing the series. A mix of adapting with the current cartoon landscape and knowing when you've exhausted a premise. We've spent some good time at this point in Ben's life. This character isn't growing beyond the individual lessons that get reset in the next episode. Heck, we got a little throwback with the Destroy All Aliens movie, but we need to move forward. So they pulled a Naruto Shippuden and time skipped. The next era of Ben 10 ramps up the maturity, the scale of the action, and so many surprises that it deserves its own video. So I'll see you in part two coming really, really soon. Make sure to hit the like button and subscribe with notifications on for more content like this. Click the join button to become a member and support the channel. Follow me on Twitter, and I'll be back with another video soon. But until then, later.